And with that, I'm going to move on to our guests. I'm super, super excited to have two incredible people here, uh, Pablo Gonzalez and Anna Gregorian. Uh, I'm not going to butcher your introduction, so I'm just going to let you do it. So why don't we start with Anna? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for our invitation. I'm Anna. I am the writer and the founder of Community Weekly, which is a weekly newsletter specifically for community managers about all the ups and downs of building a community online. I've been building communities since I think 2018, worked in very different um, industries, um, in a startup, in a beauty industry, in a VC, you name it. And currently I'm writing Community Weekly and also I'm building a startup for podcast discovery called Cradle, which is a community led startup, of course. <laughs> Thank you for being here. And I'm, uh, I'm Pablo Gonzalez. I have uh, just kind of always been obsessed with making friends with everybody I meet. And uh, that has made me follow these breadcrumbs where uh, kind of like early 2019, I was trying to figure out what I want to be when I grew up, right? At, my, at, a, at a ripe age of like uh, 39, I was trying to figure out what I want to be when I grew up. And I set off on this mission to prove that community creation is the future of business development and uh, kind of had learned these things from a started off in the construction industry, started my first business at 29 and doing green building consulting, but I got really involved in, in nonprofits. And eventually what I learned from the nonprofits, I've been able to apply in the tech world and in the investing world and a, a couple of different places to create these communities um, that drive value for companies. So I uh, started a company called be the stage live. It's a content strategy marketing agency, but our North star is that if you're not working towards building a community with your clients, you're just turning into a commodity, right? So everything we do is, is focused on creating community for our clients. And uh, I'm super pumped to be here with a couple of, oh yeah, I saw Paco at a, one of these conferences in like 2019. I'm sorry, Francisco. I saw, I met Francisco at one of these conferences in 2019. And I, you know, he was one of the first people that I saw really executing at a really, really high level, what companies can do to, to grow community as a, as a kind of like go to market driver. And I've been kind of stalking him ever since. So now I'm just really honored to be sharing a stage with him and, and to meet Dana. <laughs> You just gave up my secret identity, Pablo. How dare you? Sorry. <laughs> now, Paco's my nickname, so that's that's how I will go by. I used to go by in that previous days, but anyway. Uh, and uh, again, uh, both of these uh, uh, individuals are just fantastic people and, and, and amazing community mentors. So we're going to have a great conversation here. Uh, so um, why community conversation? So this is a different way of doing webinars, in my opinion. Uh, what I what I noticed with a lot of webinars, and, and after two and a half years of being in this uh, remote world environment, we will realize that webinars tend to be very prescriptive. Uh, usually it's a keynote or a long conversation, and there's always a complaint that there is never enough time for Q&A. So what, what I wanted to create the community conversations was a space where we can make that the spotlight of of today's uh, you know topics is is this is about you this is about uh, creating a, a back to forth conversation between our guests and the audience so you can ask questions anytime uh if you just join here uh, i see a couple people po uh, posting that there's uh, issues with the chat yes uh, we messed up zoom so the chat is disabled but we're going to communicate through the q a uh, section so we'll be reading your questions and comments through the q a uh, so use it at any time uh, we want to we want to answer and my job here is going to be to queue up those questions uh, throughout the conversation. So I'll try to make sure that everyone's questions get answered. Um, if you feel brave enough and you want to come on on camera, just raise your hand and I'll see if I can figure out how to bring you in with this new Zoom. Uh, but the idea is that if you want, you can do it. We'll let you do it. Uh, comment, share your ideas. The only rule that I have is that you are kind to everyone. You know, we may not always agree with what's been said or shared, uh, but let's show kindness and let's show uh, a real sense of community by supporting everyone here, whether you agree or not. 
Uh, and yes, there will be a recording of this and we'll send it to you in the coming days with a nice uh, summary of what was discussed along with some resources, some links so you can continue following Pablo and Anna's amazing work. And uh, with that, let's get this party started. So I am going to stop my share here uh, so that you can see all of us in camera. And I'm going to start with the first question. I'm going to kick things off uh, because this conversation is about engagement and growth. Uh, but before, let's talk a little bit about the foundation. Um, in case some of the folks here don't really know or are still on the fence, what would you say are some of the most like prominent benefits for companies to starting a brand community? And I'll uh, throw it to anyone. Anna, go ahead. Yeah, I think the biggest reason specifically for branded communities is to take con not control, but create an environment where you can gather all the people that are excited about your product and are excited about the mission of your product and take control of how your content is pre presented to them because we have all been relying on Facebook, Instagram and all those algorithms that are ruling our feeds. However, I have seen the research um, for the past few years, it shows that only 2% of your actual audience sees what you post online. And so creating a community where people can gather and create meaningful conversations about your mission, your product, um, is the way to reclaim kind of the space where, where those conversations are happening. And I just want to uh, add that uh, whether you start a community or not, the community about your product, your brand will be created somewhere. It will be on Stack Overflow, there will be a subreddit. So whether you want it or not, there will be a community for you in some capacity somewhere. So um, investing in building the community and creating the relationships in your niche, in your target market, is just a better way of managing those relationships, in my opinion. <laughs> Totally, totally. Uh, first of all, I want to shout out to Nicole Sterling, who said she signed up for your newsletter uh, just now you know, to, for Community oh. Weekly. That's awesome. Sign up for Anna's letter. Um, hey. What we, man, what we have found is that there's this concept that I'm obsessed with. It's called category design, and it is a, a different way of growing companies, right? It is the idea of instead of competing in somebody else's category, it's creating your own, right? And it has been proven that great category designers, which are the companies that you know that become synonymous with the thing that they solve for, right? Like once your company becomes a verb, you've designed a category, right? Um, and you become the category queen. There's a concept in there called the concept of super consumers. And I had the guy that wrote the book of super consumers on my podcast. And he said something that to me is really the key value of community as far as like, a value prop for a business executive or somebody who's looking to grow their company. And it's that there is nothing more powerful than two of your super consumers having a conversation about how much they love your product in front of a prospect, right? That, that will sell anybody that's interested in your stuff. That is the most powerful way to convince them much more so than you telling them how cool you are or, you know, whatever, making, making content and videos and blah, blah, blah. Like that is the number one most, you know, powerful customer acquisition tool. And I see communities as just like doing that stuff at scale, right? Like that is where else, where else is that going to happen that except for a well-organized community um, where people are having these conversations in the, in the, in the communities that we build for companies, we see that, right? Like that is, that is totally happening. We'll have somebody show up for an event and we'll have like 25 people that are our clients and love their stuff. Somebody shows up. And the moment that the moment that they're like, Oh, I just thought I was showing up for a webinar. And really what I'm showing up for is like some, the social hour of the clientele, it gets real, real for them. And what we have seen in the, in the data is that it lowers cost of client acquisition it increases the lifetime value of your clientele, right? Like most people that run a business, they don't spend a lot of time with their best clients, right? So like if you create this environment where you can spend more time with your best clients, they'll come back to you and be like, oh, you know what else I could use help with is this. <laughs> so, so all of a sudden they're doing, they're doing more things with you for longer. And like when maybe they would have thought, I don't need this product anymore. Instead, they're going to ask you. So they're going to stick around. And to that regard of, 
you know what else I could need more help with? It helps with product roadmap, right? Like if you are well connected to your community and you understand your consumer, you're going to make features and you're going to roll out products that they actually care, not what engineers think are cool, right? So to me, that, that giant feedback loop that is created inside of a community of qualitative insights um, is super, super valuable as well. So lower cost of acquisition, higher lifetime value, greater feedback and understanding of your client and better products eventually. I think it just makes the best companies. Yeah, I think, I think there's a lot of truth in there. I think there's um, the most valuable customers to the ones that you can build that emotional relationship with, right? That, that really meaningful connection. And I always believe that if you have a good product, you, you build customers, but when you start adding and offering value beyond just what your product or service is, that's when you start really connecting with people. Like you've said, word of mouth is one of the most powerful marketing, uh, uh, things that you can have for your business but you can't really buy it you can't really pay for it like you you have to almost earn it by providing or or, or being a leader in a space and and then people will will sing your prices and that's that is where the magic of communities can really show uh, as a benefit for 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 a strategy um, you touch a little bit on on value proposition, and I think this is a, a key element when when people are uh, creating communities is uh, how you attract members to communities by having a really strong value proposition, and and you know. Some people think that that means having really nice words and very ethereal, aspirational uh, statements about what a community is, but. I think that what really drives the engagement and the growth of a community is having very clear, tangible benefits for who is going to join. So let's talk a little bit about that. How do you position your community in a way that attracts, uh, you know, and they really interest people? I guess I can go first because I really only have one pitch, right? Kind of like what I, what I told you about. And I know that Anna's got a bunch of different ways of doing it. Um, I couldn't agree more, right? Like what's in it for you to be part of this community has to be loud and clear. Our, our go-to way of creating community was born off of kind of what we were doing in these like young professional groups that we started for charities, um, you know, back in like 2009, where we would host I would tell people, right? Everybody's like, you want to meet like-minded people, right? Anna, you said this backstage mm -hmm. earlier, right? Every, everybody says that. Um, so when we were trying to do these like young professional groups, we would um, we would say, oh, hey, you're in Miami. It's a flaky city. So you're going to meet nice people. But here's what we really do, right? Like when we plan our meetings, we plan our meetings at the boardroom of one of the uh, board members of the charity. So you're going to meet the superintendent of schools, you're going to meet the CEO of like Ryder Corporation, they're going to like tell you about their life. And then we're going to go plan our happy hour or whatever. Um, so we've, we've kind of like extrapolated, we, we've evolved that concept to the idea that you can kind of what you're doing right now, um, Francisco, you can host these like live shows that allow for you to put, you know, put the folks that show up attendees get to meet people that are interesting to them and are talking about things that are going to help them in their life and create this like moment of connection with them. And that starts to bring folks in to like, oh, this is interesting. And then some folks stick around, right? And then what you do is you make it, the other big aha moment I, I, I had was in that 2019 journey, I went to like my first like live podcast. And while I was there, the, the marketing director shot like a sweet picture of me, like on a microphone. You may or may not recognize it from the picture that you used to promote this thing because it's still my headshot. And at that moment, I had this like aha of like most professionals can use content made about themselves. It's good for your career. It's good for your business, whether you're in business development or not. Right. So um, what, what we do to showcase that what's in it for you is this idea of like, you can, there's interesting people, you know, you're going to meet like-minded people, but you're also going to get access to some folks that you wouldn't have access to. And on top of that, you have a direct line to that stage, right? Like we, we make sure that we showcase that that stage is something that everybody gets to be a part of. And whether it is that we mention your name during the thing so that you're hearing your name on it, or you make it obvious that people that are clients and part of the community eventually can be the star of the stage as well. We make that path crystal clear. Um, so we operate under the assumption that everybody, most folks that join a community 
uh, are trying to solve some kind of problem or something that they really, really care about. And they can use some validation. They can use a little bit of extra like marketing material about themselves. So that path to the stage is really, really clear. And once you get to that stage, then you've been guilty by association with all the other in- intelligent, fascinating, brilliant people that have been on the stage as well. So that's the that's the what's in it for you of our kind of like go-to. But Anna, I'm sure you got tons of ideas for that one. Yeah, uh, I think what you said is very important. And this idea of what's in it for you, understanding that it's it's the most crucial part of building the value proposition of the community and the mission of the community. And the thing I like to say when people are asking, okay, how do I craft this mission? Is like if you're if you're looking to start a community for Asana, let's say you're not starting a community where you're shouting how cool Asana is. You're just starting a community where you are asking people, how can I help you become a better project manager, or how can I help you to get um, get out from this bottleneck that you had with your, let's say, C-level ex- executives or engineers, like how to create better roadmaps, how to create uh, better relationships in your teams, how to make, well, you understood what I'm saying, like, uh, you need to create a better understanding, a better knowledge base for them. So my angle of creating the community and crafting the mission is how to become the place where my members would know that if you if they can come and ask a question someone will be there that they will they will get an answer for that question and uh, kind of learning what their struggles are understanding what frustrates them first of all in project management like building the roadmap in podcasting how do i get more like um listeners uh creating these tiny feedback loops if you're a podcasting community like i have one right now it one of the ways to build that engagement and also help people to make better podcasts is offer a feedback service like people can drop a link to their podcast to their whatever and you can just offer them feedback so and Eventually, in your community, people will drop their links to their projects because people are people and uh, banning self promotion like Reddit and other community does, uh, I don't think is the best idea. So better create this collaborative and co-creation environment early on. So your community will be the place where people will come for answers and people will come to help other people who once were in their position. Absolutely. Um, so I hear three things, and this is kind of like a good example of value proposition, right? Like we want you to live today with tangible takeaways that you can apply. If we just come here and talk about how cool we are, how amazing we are and the things that we build, but don't really translate that into something that you can live with, there's no value in these conversations. So for, for value proposition, your homework to do is like understanding what are the pain points of your audience. Right. You need to understand what your value, uh, what the pain points are. Then you need to figure out out of those pain points, which ones can you solve with your community? What what causes the value for them to come? What are you going to help them achieve? And then how do you position that in a way that you can grab attention? So those are kind of like the three steps that we heard on how to like really align the value proposition of your community. And that is that is really great. Um, Let's we're we're at the beginning stages and we have a couple of questions uh, from the audience. I'm gonna cue them in, but I have a question that that tends to come uh, often when we talk about creating communities. And it's like, is it normal that at the beginning there's no engagement? Like, what like what am I doing wrong? And and I think here we can talk about you know the stages of a community and and what your job is in in getting that curve started and getting that growth started. So I'll I'll pass it back to you again. Anna, you wanna go first? Um, this time? Yeah, I have I have opinions. <laughs> so I have a post actually on Community Weekly. It's called Community Engagement. And the first, I think one of the first sentences is community engagement is a feeling, not a metric. You every community manager has this feeling that, oh my God, my community is not active. Oh my God, I'm the only one posting. And I think they even have nightmares like that. <laughs> that they start a Discord server and only it's only them and the five people on their department. <laughs> But uh, I just want to say from the beginning, you're probably doing fine. Um, It's okay. People have lives. People have families, friends. They can't be online all the time. And so, um, again, as I said before, building engagement is about building that knowledge, that knowledge base in your community. And 
being kind of that place where people can trust and can come back to for to get what they need. And I think one of the reasons why people are frustrated with engagement is that there are no tangible ways to measure engagement. You don't know how to come up with a good metric to understand if, if your community is doing okay. So I, I, I would say that before panicking about engagement, come up with a unique metric for your community success, not just the growth of metric uh, members, not just like, I don't know, number of messages posted per day, but a very unique thing that is unique to your specific niche or target market like how many people got answered today how many people um, are participating in accountability challenge that i started so come up with a metric that will help you understand engagement that is unique to your community and your niche and then start panicking but most likely you're doing okay <laughs> <laughs> that's well said um yeah listen i I learned pretty early on that when you are when you're trying to build a community, you need to. We're talking specifically about branded communities right now, right? So, like, often the brand or the company or whatever they they want to be Superman, and what you got to do is you got to build the Avengers, right? Like, you, you can't you, you can't just want to carry it all yourself, or you're just gonna feel like this is a a one-way channel. Like it's no difference than an Instagram account at that point. Right. Um, so at first it is going to be that heavy lift of activity and, and the, the, the key metric that you want to get to, right. And this is why we launch our communities all around shows because you're able to, instead of just show up and be like, all right, I'm here with the community. What y'all want to talk about? You know, you, you, you bring other people, to, to talk to folks and, and you're having these like open conversations and what you're really trying to get to at first, before we, before we move to a platform, we try to make sure that there's like 10 to 15 people that show up to like every single one of these activations. Um, and those 10 to 15 people, you glorify them, right? Like they are, they are really just like, yeah, those are the folks that you really pump up every time that they're engaging, you know, you are, you're really putting them up on a pedestal, right? Like Lori, Lori Goldman, phenomenal community manager. She comes to a bunch of my shows and, and, and does, she is like in the core group of, of people that have, that have really propped up my community because she's a super high level person that works in the software industry that does all this stuff. And she comes in and asks great questions. So I'm always going to prioritize those that, that engage and, and really try to pump them up. Right. I call it sharing the stage. Um, there's a really great marketer community called peak community done by Sangram Vajra. And he does this really, really well. When somebody comes in and they're, they're real active to start immediately. They're like, they call them peak unicorns. So like, this is the unicorn of the month, right? Like I was shocked that in my first month as a member, I was the unicorn of the month. But guess what? That got me to like engage more, right? Like you want to you wanna give them positive feedback. Anybody engaging is giving them positive feedback, really making them feel a part of the process. And once you have 10 to 15 folks doing that, then, you know, the community action, everybody else that shows up is like, okay, well, it's not just one person, right? So like, it's, that's, that's the build that you really, really need to get to. And you want to figure out the fastest path possible. What we figured out that is a really good path to start that, to kickstart that is to start a cohort online class, right? Like if you can, if you can start like a class on whatever, and fundamentally, right, we talk about unique value propositions, like you really got to understand what your clientele is trying to do, right? Like it's, this isn't like a class on how to use my software. It's whoever uses your software is trying to be this person, right? So if you can, if you can figure out some kind of like class that you can teach 20 to 25 people how to, you know, go on a journey together and learn something at the same time, you know, five to 10 of those folks, they're going to stick around and be a part of it. So we pair the class with a weekly office hours advice on how to implement what you're learning in the class and then start that routine. And that starts becoming the, you know, the meeting point, the ritual that everybody comes to and shows up. Right. So 
I feel like I went really long winded there, but yes, it's totally normal that at first you're doing the heavy lifting and you got to figure out what activity you're going to do to make that heavy lift that then gets people showing up regularly and, and then makes it so that you are no longer Superman. You have your tribe of Avengers and you make the Avengers obvious to everybody. And you're always recruiting Avengers, right? Like it's the Pareto principle. 20% of people are going to be 80% of the, of the action. You want to be like fostering that as much as possible. Our trick is, you know, clear path to the stage, pump them up, make them stars inside of our community. And our, and our way to like recruit it quickly is to create a class that creates an experience that, you know, a group of people that care about the same thing are going through that then stick around for that routine of like what it is and be evangelist of what you're doing. It's amazing. Yeah. The, the, the whole many to many, uh, you know, idea of, of community, it's ultimately the goal. That's probably the hardest thing to do is just figure out how to, you know, elevate those superstars, super like fans into that position where they are now part of the contributors of the content. Anna, what what tactics, what strategies have have you found uh, work in in getting that growth from one to many to many to many um, interactions? Uh, experimenting with a lot of different uh, things, not don't, not being afraid from experimenting a lot of different things. Um, starting accountability groups, I think, is the fastest fastest way to create some kind of daily or weekly check-in that people are coming and contributing in some way. Co-working sessions were very big during the pandemic and still are to some extent because a lot of people are still working uh, remotely. Um, again, giving feedback. I think that is the bi biggest way you can um, contribute and also create a sustainable growth um, growth strategy for your community. If you can be the place where people are coming and getting advice and getting tangible um, inputs on their work in your niche, that could be a win because we everyone currently has this problem of not having enough feedback. Like uh, creators don't have feedback about their creations, podcast uh, hosts don't have feedback about their podcast, like founders don't have feedback about like, Pitch deck. So if you can build a reliable uh, weekly or monthly something that can pe people can come and know that they will get something um, for their participation, that is um, the best way, I think. Newsletter um, is another way to just distribute your learnings and knowledge that you have created inside your community to other people who are not yet in your community. Um, I think that is the fastest way and and the most easy way in my opinion again pablo you have the opinion of live shows i mean i i like them but i'm more of a newsletter girl uh so um yeah i think the the easiest way is that create some kind of feedback feedback loop feedback session and make sure to distribute the learnings from those sessions to everyone, not just your members, but also the people who are outside of your community. And I saw a question, people were asking, there are so many uh, social media platforms where you can start up your community. I think this can, um, I can answer partially that question now. Um, you need to go to place where people are already there to kind of drive the engagement from that platform and then figure out for yourself, how you are you going to find the platform that is in the best way fits your interests so if your uh, audience is in twitter let's say and um you want to start a community the first place where you are going to share and the learnings and tag all the people that are in your community is the twitter uh, logically and then try to slowly get them inside of your community and you can tie that up with zapier automate everything with make or any other integration tools just create a very easy and straightforward way of sharing the knowledge and the message from inside outside I think I think we're totally in line, Anna. Like I so I say show a lot because like I'm a show guy, right? But like it's this, right? Like even even if you have you have a newsletter, that's that's where that's where the stuff lives. But where you're talking about these engagement sessions, that's what I mean by a show, right? Like I just mean there has to be a forum where folks can come and interact with you and ask you questions and create these these feedback loops, whether it's Twitter spaces or Clubhouse or a Zoom call. Um, you know, like I just always call it a show because I, I find that adding a little bit of entertainment value to it, you know, stuff that works is 
entertain, yeah. educate, inspire, right? So like I try to add as many of those, but uh, Francisco, to your to your question of what creates growth, man, I I don't try to grow very fast, right? Like to me, the value is in the in the the tighter the nucleus, the bigger the nucleus in comparison to the rest of it, the more valuable it is. So I'm not generally trying to grow very hard. And what we found is in the in the not your average investor show community. Uh, which is for a, a rental property investing company. First year that we stood up that channel as a community, they generated $40 million from that community. And, and we have a, like a 4,000 person Facebook group, but we traced back 80, 90% of that money to a group of about 25 super engaged people that were the ones showing up to the show every single week. You know, the, that tribe of Avengers, it all came back to that. So we always we always key in on, instead of trying to grow outwards, we're trying to like grow this, you know, bigger from the inside out. Um, Cause that's where the value tends to come out. And to answer the question in, in its reality, instead of just challenging, should we be growing? Um, I totally agree that it's insights, right? Like the first thing that we do, the first thing that we do is we'll, we'll periodically just reach out to qualitative feedback interviews, right? Like I'm at a client's office today. I've literally just spent like back to back to back um, days interviewing. This is a financial planner for doctors. I've been interviewing physicians on just like, hey, what's going on in your life? What's valuable to you? What else do you want to learn about? You know, what of this stuff you've liked? What have you not liked? Um, and we also, to, to what Anna said earlier, all of these shows, all of these content production things, we'll take this recording, like what we're doing right now. When I talk about a show, it's not different than what we're doing right now. Um, we'll take this and we'll turn this into podcast. We'll turn this long form into YouTube. Also, we'll cut out the six to seven genius things that Anna says and the six to seven genius things that Francisco says and turn it into like little um, LinkedIn videos and Instagram videos and Facebook videos. And we'll spread it all around. So that kind of like that, that seed that's at the big, that the middle of the, um, of the community is getting planted in like multiple pots across different ecosystems. Um, and that, that is another feedback loop as well, right? Like we're not really looking for, um, am I going to go viral with any one of these pieces of content? We're looking for that like comment that says this with like the two like fingers pointing upwards, like this is what they really agree with. Then we're going back into that. You know, we're going back into those subjects. We're going back into that type of stuff. So it's always like looking for the qualitative feedback of what's really driving the needle to the people that you're trying to serve um, is what's going to end up driving the growth for you. Amazing. Um, I see some questions uh, popping on online. Uh, some are, uh, I'm going to save for the end because they, they're, they're going to drive us off a little bit. But here's one that I, um, for Caroline, um, Carolyn, uh, I have a very active community. But it's a small, about 50 people. We've promoted our community via email, customer service, onboarding, but the members trickle in in maybe two, three people a month versus hundreds of invites. Uh, any advice? So I guess there's a discrepancy between how much effort they're putting in promoting it versus how many people are actually going through the growth, through joining. What's going on? Not the specifics, it would be very hard to answer. Um, to be honest, um, can you read the question again? Um, I just want to hear what. Yeah, and efforts. and Caroline, if you feel comfortable uh, jumping in, just raise your hand, and maybe you can you can give us a little bit more context so we can help you. Uh, but the question says, I have a very active community. It's small, about fifty people. We promoted our community via email, customer service, onboarding, but the members trickle in in maybe two or three people a month versus hundreds of invites. Any advice? Hmm. I, I I would. My advice is to ask your members of the community, what would get you to invite three friends, right? Like I, I, I really think this community game is hand-to-hand. -hand, um, I don't want to call it combat, right? But it's, it's really, it's, it's hand-to-hand -hand networking. Um, that would be my number one piece of advice. Like they're all super engaged. They all see the value in it. You know, like what, what is, what would get you to like invite three friends and, and grow it that way? I don't, outside of that, I don't know, like is, is the, all right, Caroline's coming up. All right, cool. I think we can, I think we can workshop with her, but like, I, like to me, yeah. that would be my, my number one piece of advice is that. 
Yeah, if Caroline is coming, that would be easier. Yes, uh, I, I brought her, invited her. Let's see, uh, Caroline, if you're around, happy to chat. Uh, oh, there you Hello, are. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. This has been a problem for the last like six months or so. So happy to um, ask or answer any clarifying questions. We do offer referrals. Um, we've had, we've probably received about like 10 referrals or so from members of the community who I then reach out to, you know, name drop the person that gave the referral. We've had one person join from that. So it was, you know, semi-successful, but this is something that we continue to see is for the level of, you know, invitations of reaching out, et cetera, that we're doing. We'll have an insane open rate, like 90%, like 75% click throughs, like people are engaging with it, but the actual conversion, we just can't get that final, um, like registration to actually join the community. Again, what, what, uh, what, uh, what do you, you expect a place where people are talking all the time or, and also what is the value proposition of the community? What are you offering to them? Sure. So it comes in two parts. Our community is a way for customers to um, join and um, get like a beta, uh, like beta uh, access to some of our features. Uh, they're able to um, engage with our company on a like higher level. Um, and then we also reward them with points for uh, different engagement. So like downloading our ebook, listening to a podcast, et cetera. And from there, they're able to redeem those points for rewards. So it comes in two parts. We have like our like value to them, things that they've answered that they want like better access to with our company. Um, and then things where it benefits us more, we reward them with points so that they can get like gift cards, et cetera. Yeah. Oh, okay. That for me, honestly, um, I'm I'm honest, and I again don't know all the specifics, but it f feels like a lot about your company. Still, what I'm hearing is like our product feedback to our product, ebooks, podcast. That's all good, but um, again, the question that we talked about in the beginning: what's in it for them? Like, how? why would you would they enjoy spending time there that's the question what is the experience that makes your members enjoy being in the community like listening to podcasts they can do that on spotify mm -hmm. um why come for listening to a podcast to a server or discord server or slack workspace or whatever so that's that's what's ringing for me maybe try to align with their needs and i think Pablo mentions this before, talk to them and see what they need other than ebooks, podcasts, content, um, more of one-to-one peer-to-peer support and then try to connect them. Mm -hmm. What do yeah, you I have? like that. That's, it's um, what we're pushing more for this, um, for this half of the year, hence the reason I'm on this, uh, on this webinar is really understanding like what are some of the items that are um, beneficial. So we love the idea of having more like community, um, community events and those like one-to-one -one conversations. We've started rolling that out, um, but obviously like with our, we do have that highly engaged group, you know, we do have a great like 50 people who are continuing to interact with us. Um, but yeah, it looks like with, as we roll out more of these customer facing benefits, uh, just to continue to promote those to these people who we've previously invited. Carolyn, what does your product do and for whom? Um, our product, so we um, are a property tech company. So we create, uh, we have like an app for property managers where they can do like uh, residents can send in payments, uh, maintenance invoices, et cetera. Gotcha. Got it. Got it. All right. So I have very much one-to-one -one experience on this. <laughs> um, so it sounds like, again, I, I, I agree with, with Anna, right? Like we, we had this problem with the not average investor show, right? Rental property investing company. These are all rental property investors, very similar to, 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 to your people. They, they're only going to want to talk about rental property investing a certain amount of their life, right? So mm -hmm. like when I, when I sat down with uh, the founder of that company, you know, I was just like, hey, man, you know, have you ever thought about the fact that 
you shouldn't just be educating people on real estate and the benefits of real estate. They have other questions, right? Like mm-hmm. rental property investors have, have questions along the lines of, you know, yes, is real estate right for me? And I want to understand real estate, but they also have questions of like, is this city worthwhile investing in? They have questions about like, should I be putting my money here versus crypto or versus the stock market or other things? They also have the questions of who else is doing this and, and whatnot, right? So um, we call that the, the, the content lanes of what the, com- the community or the content stream should talk about. And this kind of goes to, Sylvia keeps asking, a couple of people keep asking like, what is this value prop thing, right? Like the value prop thing is basically understanding like if you know your client, right? Like you got property managers and and maybe it's, I don't know if you're your buyer or, or whoever uses the product itself, um, who they are, they care about, you know, they care about a set of things and your solution is one part of the set of things that they care about. Right. So if you can figure out, yes, all right, there's plenty of space to talk about property taxes and and talk about this stuff. But what are the other things that they really, really want to talk about that helps them become the best version of themselves as property managers or employees of property management companies or whatnot? And you open that umbrella a little more, you're going to find that more people want to be a part of the conversation. Um, and, and, and that's going to help you grow it out a little bit instead of being so laser focused on like, you know, you have your super users of the software. They want to be amazing at using the software, but they also want to be amazing at other things. So like kind Mm -hmm. of like figuring what that is, is going to help you make that what we keep calling the value proposition, right? Like this idea of like, what's in it for me is what we mean by the value proposition and what's in it for them, you know, like being the super user of a software is like pretty good value proposition. But if it's like, crushing your career, this is your value proposition. It's bigger, right? So that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm hearing. Awesome. Awesome. No, this has been all great advice. Amazing. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, Caroline, I'm gonna, I'm gonna disable the talking uh, so we can keep going. Um, I'm hearing a lot of great uh, things in the chat. Uh, Somebody asked, where can we keep these conversations going? And I think that's a great idea. Um, I promise to have a solution for it. Uh, We do have our campfire community and that's where we hope all of you uh, follow us. Um, And I, and this kind of sparked an idea to to start something specific for these conversations within the campfire community. So um, leave that with me and I'll come up with something. Let's see. Uh, Oh, this is a good one. Uh, It feels like my entire team is struggling with inspiration for content for both growth and engagement for a grief support community. Uh, What do you do when you're lacking inspiration? I think we've all been there. We've all been through that creative block of what else should we tell these these folks, right? Um, any say, any ideas? Yeah, go ahead. I'd say just talk, uh, create case studies or talk to your members. That is the best way. Um, you, if you have not done it already, of course. Um, the other thing is, um, I just answered the question in the chat. Someone asked, "What is accountability group?" And I said, "The best example of accountability group is book club. Start a like book club. Start a, something." that people can engage together and they, you can write content about how different people felt about that book or content that people were engaging with. Um, asking the members, ask members what they are interested in, what you what they want to hear from you. Um, if again, you have not already done that. Or another a trusty way, a bit of a cheat, uh, go on askthepublic.com uh, and see what pu- people are Googling on that topic and see just maybe so- something sparks your in- inspiration. I think it's, yeah, askthepublic.com. Man, Faye, what you're dealing with is so heavy, right? Like grief support community, right? Mm-hmm. Like I, like that's totally normal to, to feel the, I think being in community, you feel the weight of it sometimes. Um, but being in such a important, heavy topic, totally, totally normal to, to feel that, right? Like I, I definitely echo with Anna. Uh, I mean, my answer is always going to be talk to your people, you know, like, like, like talk to people, right? Like um, that being said, I think that that's a tough one for it, right? Because it's like, Hey, you're struggling with grief. How can I help you? It's like, Oh man, it's freaking struggling with grief. Um, You know, sometimes just breaking the, breaking the paradigm completely, right? Like go take, 
like go find, I always find that the, the best stuff that I come up with comes from a completely different context, right? If you can take something from a different context, but what works for that context and then contextualize it to your context, that's where you're going to find like these like really innovative breakthrough ideas. Um, so what, what does that look like? I guess, I guess that sounds really, really abstract not to just hear myself talk. Um, you know, like I, I'll give you an example. I got a, I got a friend named Whitney. Who's like the, she's like the real life flow from progressive. Like she's like the most pumped up insurance agent of all time that has like an awesome insurance company. And, um, I was able to, she was struggling finding people to like deal with their proposals because she wants her insurance agent selling. Um, and, uh, and, and not just writing proposals. And I was like, listen, in the construction industry, there's a whole, there's something called a request for proposal. And there's people that are literally trained just to like, look at all the, like the P's and Q's of everything. And if you can get somebody from that industry to just be doing that all day long, but in insurance, it could really help. And it's really, really helped her, right? So like, I would go look at another community or another content stream that you really, really like and be like, what's working for them? Right. So for the Not Your Average Investor show, I love going to this. There's a there's a show called The Best One Yet that are like two guys that make funny like financial news about the stock market. I've taken stuff from from them. Steal like an artist. Right. Like look at look at other things that are working in other contexts and then try your own version of that within your own context. And it's not like, you know, like, yes, engagement questions work, but like look at more like the qualitative stuff. What is it that makes it that makes you resonate, that makes you feel good and dive into like the psychology of why that works and then contextualize it to a topic like grief support. Amazing. I think we have time for one more. Uh, this is from anonymous uh, attendee. If you build a community um, in a multilingual, multi multilingual ca country slash target group, would you recommend to build one community for each individual language or do you just do one community and add translate functionalities to posts? Because one community is easier to promote and grows faster, but one with the mixed languages could confuse members. I, that's a that's the best question I have ever heard. Of me. <laughs> I I talk four languages and uh, I kind of understand uh, what the asker is saying here. So I have been actually a member of a couple of multilingual amazing communities, and and but I have never built one myself. But what I can say as a member of those communities, what worked for them is they had separate spaces they had one big community that was in the in the majority language that people were speaking and in that community they had separate spaces in other languages um so the 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 specific community that I was talking about, it was in Russian and it had a section in English, Armenian and Lithuanian. So uh, that's how I have seen people do it. But I and the other part of that question is that I assume English one is much uh, easier to promote because majority of Internet is in English and localization is a headache. But I would say that creating a community that is m maybe necessarily not very active, but is very hyperactive in a language that is not very distributed is a huge huge plus if you are trying to expand in that country or you are trying to establish yourself as a brand in that country because again as i mentioned localization is a pain and people still need resources that don't speak or don't like speaking in english language that's a great answer, Bayana. I'm going to add very little to that equation, except for the idea that I, I, I agree, like I speak Spanish and English. And when you do something in Spanish, it like it, it, it like floods in because so much of things are in English. The only other kind of like thing that I might be able to add to this conversation is that there's also a lot of Spanglish, right? So like if there is there is an opportunity to like do a crossover where it's like, you're speaking in both languages at once because there's a high correlation. I think people really identify that when there's these cultures that have been like intermixing for a long time, if that's applicable, I think there's an opportunity there. And you see that across like art right now, right? Like there's tons of like, like Pitbull was the first guy that was like Spanish and English at the same time. And now there's all these other people that are, that are doing it. So whatever languages you're talking about, if there's the opportunity to go like mix of both, I think that that's also a nice way to hit it because chances are that there's a lot of overlap in those communities. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Uh, 
Sylvia asks uh, on that subject, uh, could, could a multilingual feature actually limit the expansion and more importantly, impact the community? Mm, I don't, I guess the, again, I have not ever built a community that is multilingual, but as a member, I would say, um, have the, the biggest thing here is having different community managers who speak that language. I think that is the bottleneck for most communities like that. And also trying to replicate the English section or the dominant language section to other communities because that is important. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have never had experience with that communities other than as a member. Yeah. I got another. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally okay. Uh, okay, how much time we have? We have three minutes. Okay, so I think I'm gonna I'm gonna stop the questions here. Uh, I'm gonna go back to um, our lovely. Oh, we started it. Um, but first of all, I want to say thank you to everyone. I, I chose this this topic because. As you can see, we could we could spend hours, and I, I think we just even like we just scrap the, the the tip of the iceberg. Uh, so I'm going to shamelessly and publicly invite Pablo and Anna if you are willing. I think there the, there's a lot of things we didn't discuss. Uh, we'd love to have you back at some point uh, for a, for a second part of this conversation. I think our members uh, were asking where can we keep this going. Uh, so there's interest. So we're gonna try to to get the band back together and continue the conversation. Um, but thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for being part of this. For, for If you join, please give us feedback. We're going to receive a survey. Tell us uh, what else you want to talk about. We're, we're building these conversations around what things that are important to you. Um, join our campfire community. As I said, I will uh, figure out a way to, to find a group for us to, to continue chatting within campfire. And uh, you will receive an email with the recording uh, and a summary of, of what was discussed today. Um, so with that, I want to invite you to our next uh, Industry Experts webinar. Uh, that's going to be next week, just a week from today. Uh, we have a really uh, amazing guest, Pramod Rowe. He's the founder and CEO of Threado. And he's going to talk about trends uh, for community-led brands. So, um, you know, we, we, we briefly talk about this. But if you want to hear a little bit more about you know, what's trending, what are things that are being, uh, what are working for uh, community-led uh, brands, um, join us. Join us next week. You'll receive the, the link. I can't put it in the chat, unfortunately, but uh, I'll make sure that you receive the, the, the link uh, for you to join us next week. Same time, Wednesday, 12 p.m. I'll be here. Um, so... Uh, with that, that's it. Thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you for joining us, Pablo, Anna. Uh, sincere thanks for, for your time. I, this was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. I enjoyed this experience very much and the questions. Totally agree. I'm, I'm in to do this a hundred times every day of the week with the two of you. You're, you're great. Thanks so much for it. was an honor being here. Appreciate it. Awesome. Now I'm going to ultimately figure out and then we go backstage. Hit the backstage button. See what happens. Yeah. Okay. All right. See you, everybody.